Thank you so much. Uh, it's such an uh, honor and privilege to be here today with you and uh, to share about our God, who is the God of uh, history and uh, uh, wonderful words we sang together. We worship the God who was, who is, who holds the victory. Our God, we shout your praise. That's exactly what uh, I wanted to do today with you and uh, look look at our God who knows history in such detail and knows it in advance. And, uh, you know, uh, following God is never should never be boring because if you think you know everything, God has a lot to uh, share. God has a lot to open to you. And uh, that's what he did with Daniel. It's an amazing story uh, how God revealed centuries, centuries of history ahead of time to Daniel. And uh, I don't know, maybe you know all of this, but I'm very excited about our God and just wanted to share once again and uh, uh, share about what happened, what happened in history and what we know um, for sure that came to life. And uh, part of the prophecies of Daniel are still to happen. And I'm not going to talk about that today. But I just wanted for us to have a look and see what an amazing God we believe in. And uh, probably all of you know, the, the four empires predicted in the... <clears throat> When Daniel was a very young man, God gave him the understanding of the dream, of the dream. And it's amazing how accurate uh, all those uh, empires uh, were in God's prediction. And um, it's interesting that God reveals, so the, the prophecy was given to Daniel in 604 BC, and uh, basically God reveals to him the next thousand years, next 600 years in detail, and uh, uh, what what happened? What happened after the Roman Empire? Did something uh, special happen at that time? We know that Jesus Jesus came to Earth. And uh, it's amazing uh, to to um, read read about the, the details because, for example, the Greek Empire is uh, called the Bronze Empire, and that's exactly what uh, was widely used during that time. That's exactly what uh, Greeks were using for their weapons, for their uh, jewelry. Uh, they had a lot of bronze coins, and that's what they were known for. And in fact, we even call it the Bronze Age, right? And then uh, the Iron, um, uh, Iron uh, Age and uh, Roman Empire was known for their iron. And they used it, the, it in their military. Uh, they used it for their swords, their helmets, their shields. And in fact, one of the uh, poets... Uh, Virgil, and he, uh, this is what he says, iron seizes the lands. That's what he said about the uh, Roman Empire. And God told this to Daniel 600 years in advance. And uh, throughout the life of Daniel, God talks to him a number of times. And he uh, reveals himself, basically the same story, but uh, through different images and uh, in different details. And um, <clears throat> uh, it is uh, just fascinating to see the number of details. Because uh, later on, in 539 B.C., uh, God tells Daniel that there will be three more Persian kings. 
And that's exactly what happened. Three more Persian kings. Then um, God says to be succeeded by a fourth, far richer than the others, and he will use his wealth to stir up everyone to fight against the kingdom of Greece. And we know that story of the 30 Spartans and the Xerxes who uh, attacked Greece. And uh, God gave that story early on to Daniel. And um, then the, there's in chapter 8, there's this image of a ram and a goat. And so ram represents the um, Medo-Assyrian Assy uh, Empire. And uh, there's this new, new empire, and it says, Suddenly a male goat appeared from the west, crossing the land so swiftly that he didn't even touch the ground. So uh, when um, Med Medo-Persian Empire uh, was conquering the land, um, it took them, I think it was uh, 14 years, to conquer one city, Tyre. It took them 14 years. And uh, when Alexander the Great came and conquered this Medo-Persian Empire, it took him three, three to four years to conquer the whole empire. And that's exactly what was described in this uh, image given to Daniel. And then it, it comes to a point where uh, the Greek Empire will defeat the Medo-Persian Empire. And... Uh, but after that, and uh, God gives Daniel several visions in chapter 8, in chapter 11. So that's in 550 B.C. And then in another, after 11 years, he gives similar visions and talks about similar events. And uh, this is what God says. The goat became very powerful, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off. Then a mighty king will rise to power who will rule with great authority and accomplish everything he sets out to do. And that's exactly, exactly what happened to Alexander the Great. He was a mighty king. He did everything he wanted. He was very fast and furious. And then his large horn, during the height of his power, it was broken off. And... Uh, It's interesting because Alexander the Great, he did have a son, but uh, when Alexander the Great suddenly um, died, his son, who was yet to be born, didn't inherit the empire. And in fact, uh, history tells us that later on his wife and his son was uh, were killed by one of the uh, generals, his uh, former friends. Um, and uh, we all know this story that instead of one horn, God shows an image that four horns pointing in four directions of the earth would arise, but none as great as the first. And again, we see that 200 years in advance, God gives Daniel in details what is to happen. Um, and uh, in uh, 323 BC, this is exactly what happened. Four horns and the four generals of Alexander the Great, they became the, king, the four kings of the four empires. And so you can see over here, somewhere there, there's Judah, Israel. And uh, it's happened so that the Ptolemies and Seleucides were fighting over uh, with one another, and Judah happened to be in between all the time. And um, it's uh, interesting, oh, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, it's interesting that God gives Daniel the first vision um, of the four empires, 
Then he gives uh, him more detailed vision of the goat and the ram. And then in, in chapter 11, 550 BC, um, I'm sorry, that's not, that's a mistake there. It's 539 uh, BC. So 11 years after that, God continues to give even more details. And when we read and study history, it's just mind-blowing. It, it's like God was not telling the future. It's like he was a history teacher, and he was just telling you what had happened. But no, God was giving these uh, details 500, 400, 200 years in advance. And uh, look at these uh, details. So God says that, the king of the south, that's Ptolemies, will increase uh, in power, but one of his own officials will become more powerful than he and will rule his kingdom with great strength. And that's uh, crazy to uh, find that in history because uh, so Ptolemy was the king of the south, the king Seleucus was uh, the king of the north, and he was given Babylon. But then, because of a revolt there, he had to flee to King Ptolemy, the king of the south. So he fled there, and he was serving King Ptolemy for the first. And then he regained power in Babylon, and that empire became stronger than the Ptolemies. And God gives all these details in advance. And then God continues. God continues. He says, some years later, an alliance will be formed between the king of the north and the king of the south. The daughter of the king of the south will be given in marriage to the king of the north to secure the alliance, but she will lose her influence over him, and so will her father. She will be abandoned along with her supporters. That's exactly what happened, because Ptolemy the second decided to, to strengthen the relationship with the Seleucids, and he gave his daughter to marry the king of uh, the, the uh, Seleucid kingdom. But the problem was that um, Antiochus II already had a wife. He already had children, and uh, his first wife became concerned what will happen to her? And so she poisoned the second wife w with her husband. So that, that wasn't a good plan. And uh, in fact, same year, the father, the king of the south, died as well in Egypt. And look how God knows all the turns of history. God continues. God continues and he tells that, but when one of her relatives becomes king of the south, and that's exactly what happened, her brother became the new king, he will raise an army and enter the fortress of the king of the north. Fortress, and that's exactly what this new king did. He conquered the capital, the capital of this kingdom. And... God says when he returns to Egypt, he will carry back their idols with him. And that's exactly what this Ptolemy III did. He brought back the idols that were taken from Egypt. He brought them back to Egypt. And again, this was prophesied in 539 B.C. In 246, it came to life. There, we're skipping some other, we're skipping some other prophecies, but uh, this is an important one: the small horn. And um, um, again, it's amazing how uh, detailed the prophecy is. And it says that uh, uh, he will reign over the south, over east, the Persia, and the glorious land, the land of Israel. And uh, now. We'll take a break from prophecies and we'll just uh, go into Judea 
because uh, so Judea was run by the uh, Seleucids, uh, by uh, these Greek Greek uh, kings, and um, in Judea, uh, the high priest was the ru the ruler, and um, this high priest had a fascinating name. Who knows how does Jesus sound in Hebrew? Yeshua. And so this, na uh, this priest's name was Yeshua. And actually he wasn't the high priest. His brother was. But uh, what do you do if you like, really, really want that job? So he bribed Antiochus IV. And uh, he became appointed to be the high priest. And he wanted to fit into this Greek culture so much that he even took a Greek name, Jason, to replace his amazing name, Yeshua. He took a Greek name, Jason. And uh, what, what did he start... What did, what did he do during his rule? Um, he increased Hellenization, becoming more like Greeks. And uh, he actively promoted Greek culture and adopted Greek customs in Jerusalem. And uh, he constructed a gymnasium, one of the um, uh, gymnasium inside Jerusalem. And it was uh, a center for Greek education and physical fitness, and uh, well, it was a clear symbol of Hellenization. Uh, he encouraged Jews to participate in uh, Greek games. He loved loved sports, and I can understand that. Uh, but uh, in order to participate there, you had to bring an offering to the Greek god Hercules. Well, if that's the price, that's fine. So that's what. The high priest of Judah did, he brought, he made the offering to the Greek god of Hercules. And not only that, but uh, he allowed, he allowed to put other idols, idols to different gods within the Jewish temple itself. And I think uh, this is a, uh, um, such a telling story for us today. I think that's uh, that's what hap uh, that's what's happening around the world when high priests are not only um, not not talking about the Hellenization around us, but they're bringing that to the, the temple. They're bringing idols to the temple. They're bringing a very different mindset, very different worldview to the temple. Embracing it and leading their people to embrace it. Um, Jason tried so hard to fit into this Greek culture, but uh, you know what? It didn't help him um, because soon there was another priest that gave a, a bigger bid and uh, he became the the new high priest uh, but uh, he continued the same uh, the same policies and um, so Antiochus the fourth and he was he he called himself uh, Epiphanes uh, which meant manifested from God but uh, among his people, he was secretly known by a variation of his title, Epimanes, which meant madman. And that's, that's the kind of person he was. And um, <clears throat> again, uh, it's uh, cr crazy to read the details of the prophecy. Because God says, then at an appointed time, he will once again invade the south, but this time the result will be different for warships from western coastlands will scare him off and he will withdraw and return home. So you remember that 
map, the yellow uh, kingdom, the green kingdom, the cap having wars. And so uh, Antiochus IV, again, invades Egypt. But the Pt Ptolemies make a deal with the Romans. And Roman ships come to Egypt and they meet uh, Antiochus the first, fourth, and uh, uh, it was a very humiliating defeat. And there, there's this famous story that the Roman general uh, took his stick and made a circle around him in the sand, and said that uh, Antiochus fourth has had to retreat, and uh, he had time until this Roman general leaves this circle. So Antiochus uh, had to retreat fast, and uh, he was uh, humiliated, and he w was considering to be someone close to God, and maybe to be a god, and uh, he had to retreat. And so he was frustrated, and uh, this is, a th like this, Verse 29 is very important to what happened next. Because, uh, and God says, but he will vent his anger against the people of the Holy Covenant and reward those who forsake the covenant. And uh, so King Antiochus sends his tax collector and he sort of comes in peace to Judea because that's on their way back, right? And then on Sabbath, they start killing Jewish people. And on the other hand, they reward the Jews who supported Hellenistic policies. Again, 400 years in advance, God knows these tiny little details. And um, you probably know the tragic story. And this is a very very difficult uh, verse to read. The army of heaven was restrained from responding to this rebellion. So the daily sacrifice was halted and truth was overthrown. The horn succeeded in everything it did. And then later on, God gives more details. His army will take over the temple fortress pollute the sanctuary, put a stop to the daily sacrifices, and set up the sacrilegious object that causes desecration. He will flatter and win over those who have violated the covenant. And that's uh, one of the tragedies that happened to the Jewish people and to the temple because... Um, King Antiochus outlawed Jews, uh, Jewish religious practices. They were not allowed to uh, do circumcision, observe Sabbath. They were not allowed to sacrifice offerings in the temple. And in fact, he came and uh, he set up a Greek god to Zeus in, in, inside the Jewish temple. And then he sacrificed a pig. And so this act of desecration was severe affront to the Jewish religious beliefs. And he persecuted Jews, and uh, he killed killed a lot of Jewish people. But uh, God knew what was to happen, and uh, God says, "But the people who know their God will be strong, and will resist Him." That's exactly what happened with Judah, the Maccabee, the hammer of Judah. And there was a Jewish revolt, and they took back the temple. And uh, it's uh, interesting. Uh, so so that's, that's where the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah comes from. And when they recaptured the temple, there was just a small quantity of uh, pure oil, and it should have lasted just for one day, but it burned for eight days. And uh, uh, in remembrance of this uh, event and this liberation, 
uh, Jewish people still celebrate Hanukkah, and they have a special menorah with eight candles, symbolizing every day uh, that uh, the, the candles burned. And uh, they uh, celebrate being rededicated to, to, to the God, the God of Israel, the God of history. And uh, it's um, amazing, uh, amazing to see the details prophesied, prophesied about Antiochus IV, uh, because uh, it is it is said that he will be the master of deception, and uh, that's exactly what he did. Uh, he he sort of pretended to be a friend of the Jewish people in the beginning and promised them religious freedom. And then he attacked them, banned them, and killed them. It is said in the Bible that he will become arrogant. And uh, that's exactly what he did, starting from his title and all his policies and practices tell about talk about this. Uh, he, it is said that he will be destroying many without warning. And he killed many thousands of Jews. And it, it is also said that he will take on the prince of princes. And uh, he attacked the God of Israel, the, the whole concept of the one true God who had his place in Jerusalem. And the uh, last fact, and again, I find it fascinating because it, it is prophesied that he will be broken, though not by human power. So when, when the revolt happened, uh, Antiochus IV uh, wasn't there. So he, he was... Um, in different part of his kingdom, um, taking uh, part in, in one of the other battles. Uh, and he wasn't killed in a battle. He got um, infected by some disease, and suddenly he died without being killed by a man, and again, literally fulfilling the prophecies. He will be broken, though not by human power. And um, I don't know if you know, but Jesus, Jesus himself also celebrated uh, Hanukkah. We read in the Bible that um, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. That's exactly... Um, Hanukkah and uh, describe it, it. Feast of Dedication is exactly what we've been talking about. And uh, Jesus came to Jerusalem and he was part of the Hanukkah celebration. And uh, it's uh, an amazing story, but because it connects the Old Testament, the prophecies that were foretold by God, it connects the period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it connects the New Testament where Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. And um, some of this can be overwhelming, especially when, when we look not only um, back in history, but we look in future and try to understand the future. It can be uh, overwhelming. And uh, it was overwhelming for, uh, for Daniel at some point. Uh, because uh, chapter 8, verse 18 says, While he was speaking, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. That's how overwhelming it was for Daniel. Uh, but uh, I really love the, the last verse of uh, the book of Daniel. I think it's so amazing because uh, God says there to Daniel, and I believe he says that to each one of us. As for you, go your way until the end. You will rest 
And then at the end of the days, you will rise again to receive the inheritance set aside for you. Those are such amazing words. And, um, you know, um, our Bible talks about uh, the creation of the world. But uh, we have only two pages about the creation. While I think there could be volumes, volumes uh, written about the creation. Like, how, how did it happen? How did God actually do it? But we have just two pages. And, uh, of course, there are a lot of prophecies about the end times in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, in other uh, prophecies. But um, the, the main bulk of the Bible... Is about the history of the Jewish people, the life of Jesus, and about our relationship with God. And that's what we have to remember that uh, our main goal, goal as Christians is to follow God, to know God, to have relationships with Him. And He will open um, His uh, prophecies, His wisdom to us when, when it is needed. But uh, it is most important for us to follow God. And uh, as we've seen in the history, there were times when people knew their God and uh, people who, who didn't, who didn't know their God, who forgot their God. And uh, I think uh, it's uh, such an amazing reminder to us that uh, our God is an amazing God who knows every little tiny bit of history in advance, hundreds of years in advance. And uh, he not only knows that, but he reveals that. And uh, book of Bible, the, the, the book that we have, the app that we have on our phone is the most trustworthy book, most tr trustworthy app. And uh, I hope that after today, uh, your faith will be strengthened, and uh, you will know that you can trust this God. You have to trust this God, because He is the living God who knows what is to happen in your life. And uh, God is not only God of the past, but He is God of today. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm confident that uh, during, during these events... Um, that took place at Hanukkah, a lot of Jewish people missed that it was God making his history. When Jesus came, a lot of people around him missed that it was God making history. And today, unfortunately, I think that a lot of Christians are also missing God making history. Because God is continuing to be the God of history and the God of Israel. The Israel was reborn literally in one day. When we went to Israel, we saw the deserts that are literally blooming. And that's what Bridge for Peace is basically all about. We just want to stand on God's side of history. We want to be part of this amazing God's work. And uh, it's, it's uh, such, uh, I think it hurt God so much that for so many centuries, Christians who were following God were persecuting the Jewish people who were also trying to follow God. And uh, this is what the British for Peace is trying to do and bring reconciliation. And uh, most of our work is done in Israel. We have offices in eight other countries. Uh, and uh, I think it's a beautiful picture that uh, we serve in Israel as Christians from around the world. Not just Christians from Canada or United States, but Christians from South Africa, from Japan, from South Korea. We come and serve in Israel to show Christ and Christ's love. And uh, we, we try to do that through compassion to come and love our brothers and sisters in Israel. And uh, we try to encourage churches to pray, pray for Israel, because that's what we are taught in the Bible. 
And so many churches have forgotten about it. So a big project for Bridge for Peace is uh, helping the Jewish people come back home to Israel. And overall, we've helped over 100,000 people come to Israel. This is, uh, uh, these stats show you how uh, many more people from Russia this year are coming to Israel, the Jewish people. There are about 600,000 Jewish people in Russia. And I don't know how uh, much you're following the recent events, but just uh, a week ago, uh, in one of the Muslim provinces in, Ru in Russia, um, they were hunting for Jewish people. They were, they were hunting Jewish people, uh, running around the airport looking for the Jewish people. Thank God they didn't find them. I don't know what they were planning to do. And uh, this uh, um, anti-Semitism that is rising all around the world. One tiny little nation hated in Russia, in France, in the Middle East, and just recently two people were killed in the United States just for being Jewish. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not much better in Canada. Recently, I was at one of the conferences uh, in Ottawa uh, dedicated to fighting anti-Semitism. And at the end of the conference, there were aggressive protests outside, so we had to use the back door. I think that was a terrible way to end the anti-Semitism conference. And as I, I decided to go and have a look at the protesters, one of them wearing a mask started following me, even as I was going towards my hotel. He didn't want to talk, but just kept aggressively staring. I, don't, I didn't know what was on his mind. And he was following, following me. And then when I reached police, he stopped that. And I'll think about the Jewish families with their kids who might be wearing a kippah or a Star of David. And that's happening in Canada. And, uh, you know, the anti-Semitism is not, is not a problem of the Jewish people. It's a problem of everyone. And we have to stand with the Jewish people and uh, show them the support of people outside of their community. And uh, when, when the Jewish people come to Israel, a lot of them are fleeing their countries and they come uh, with um, nothing. And so we help them uh, to establish in Israel. So we, ha we are feeding 24,000 needy Israelis every month. And it's actually a one-year program. So they sign up for this program. And hopefully during that year they can learn their language, find a job and next year they don't need our assistance. And uh, uh, we, we are basically just the hands uh, of Christians from around the world. So uh, every year this, uh, this percentage changes because uh, some year we do more with the immigration, some, year, some years like, thi like this we do more with crisis assistance, and you may wonder what what uh, that is. This is our team. Uh, overall, we have around 60 volunteers in Jerusalem. And uh, after the terrible uh, terror attack, day two, we were delivering food and blankets and clothing to the people affected, uh, to the people in the southern part of Israel. Uh, we've, uh, just last week, we've installed four bomb shelters. And... Uh, um, <clears throat> we're also purchasing an uh, intensive care ambulance. Um, we're also doing some smaller projects, like a fun day for kids, just trying to bring some smiles to their faces. And uh, this is our team who had to take cover in a bomb shelter. So in between packaging food, uh, organizing fun days for children, they have to run to the bomb shelters. And uh, we did very different projects, like just a Shabbat meal, Friday night Shabbat meal for the displaced families. Uh, we helped purchase some printers, computers to uh, arrange the funerals. 
because there were so many people that had to be buried. Um, one of our uh, volunteers, uh, uh, volunteer families, they were scheduled to leave uh, Israel, and uh, they they had living in Israel for a while, and they had some furniture which they donated, and we were able to furnish an apartment for one of the displaced families. And uh, so, overall, uh, this is what British for Peace is about. We're trying to be on God's side and to be part of His work today because our God is not only the God of the past. And uh, you can uh, um, go on British for Peace website. You can download our app. And every Friday, there are uh, specific prayer items, how to pray for Israel. And we're really encouraged to include Israel in your prayers. Pray about Israel Pray for Israel with your families. Pray for Israel in your prayer groups. Pray for Israel in church. Because uh, God, God has big plans for the world through Israel. And uh, we also publish a magazine. If uh, you enjoy magazines, you can subscribe for free. And every second month, you'll be receiving a magazine that is designed in uh, Israel. As you know, we take tours, and when things settle down, uh, actually right now Victoria is working on, a, on two tours in uh, October. Uh, one is going to be a woman's tour, and the other one is a slow-paced tour. We also have a young adult tour, a young adults tour, and uh, Christians from all around the world uh, go on a two-week uh, tour. Mm which is a great experience. But uh, also we have uh, a one-year volunteering program in Israel for young adults age 18 to 30. So if you don't uh, know what to do with your life, with your gap year, uh, it's an amazing opportunity to live in Israel, to volunteer, to um, study Bible in the land, and to see the land for yourself and to live, to live there, not just visit, but uh, live there. And uh, uh, we have uh, Bridges for Peace social media and Bridges for Peace Canada. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about Israel, uh, we encourage you to subscribe. And just uh, uh, finishing, finishing, I'd like to say that uh, we have to be taking part in God's work. And God's work is done here in Winnipeg, and God's work is done in Israel. And what's happening in Israel will influence the whole world, and it will influence us Christians. And uh, um, may you be encouraged by our God, who is the God of history and the author of our lives. And he knows the times, and he counts the days, and he invites us to join him in his divine story. So let us be the light in the darkness, in the darkness around us, proclaiming the truth of his promises to the world. As we journey through history, may we do so with faith, courage, and deep commitment to God's plan. For he is the one who reveals himself through ages. Amen.